today I'm going to be sharing with you some, some powerful principles uh, from, from scripture, but also from life and from those experiences. And I, I hope and pray that it'll bless your heart and invite you uh, into a closer relationship with God and also in support of uh, the church and the ministries that God has given to us as a people. And so it's a joy to be with you all. I wish there was a way, maybe there is, I don't know. Oh, I guess I can see a little bit more. Most of you guys have things turned off. Okay, that makes sense. But um, so it's just a joy to be with you and uh, may God continue to bless each of you. So before we jump into uh, our, our time together, I invite you to bow your heads and pray with me. And our Lord God Almighty, thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being together and to be able to worship here this evening. Thank you also, Father, for the gift of technology that allows us to come from many different places and to be able to meet in this space right here together. And so I just come before you and I ask, Father, that you will speak to us through your word, through life, through experiences. May your spirit touch each one of us exactly where we need and, and encourage us forward in our journey with you and in our growing forward as the body of Christ. Uh, Father, these have been some challenging times for many people. Uh, the, with COVID and, and changes, the financial changes, uh, the, the ability to come together, it's, it's impacted many people's faith and there's been lots of distress, depression and discouragement. And so I just pray, Father, I pray that you will help us to lift our eyes to you and to, to be able to grow through this experience and be drawn closer to you. So bless us abundantly in our time we have here. Thank you. Uh, we surrender our hearts to you and ask that you speak now in the name and authority of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, uh, one of the challenges of doing a uh, Zoom thing is I know there's very little interaction between uh, you and me. That's just part of how it works. So sorry about that. Um, but I want to share with you a few thoughts this evening that I hope are going to touch you deeply. And they're actually coming to you from another part of the world. See if I can show you this here with my tripod. So I'm going to share with you a story that happened right over here in Cambodia. I don't know if you're able to see that okay. It looks like it. And when my, my family and I were there, my wife and uh, two of our children were there, it was, it was a powerful experience. We, we learned many things and our lives were changed. I, I may have shared some of those experiences with you, just the, the reality of being complete idiots, uh, to be put in a country where you couldn't speak the language where all of a sudden to go shopping for food would have everybody laughing at you because you couldn't communicate and you're trying to do whatever it takes to find your food. And I recently shared a children's story, uh, one of our churches, where <laughs> this, this literally happened to us. I was so proud of myself because I'd been going into the market. I had been figuring out how to do the money so they weren't cheating me as much. And and I had finally found, oh, sorry, that clicked the wrong way. Um, let me go back here. Tried to turn a notification off and it took over. <clears throat> I finally found some brown rice because I, we knew that eating white rice all the time was not going to be good for our bodies. And so I, I, it's like I came home with, uh, like, like I just found a treasure. I was so excited. I brought home this brown rice, gave it to my wife. And then she began to clean it and try to prepare it. But the problem was, it was filthy. It had rocks, had dirt, had straw, had all these pieces in it. And so she's, she's cleaning it two and three times, trying to get everything out. And even then, when she cooked it, we had to eat very carefully because you don't want to catch a rock in the back of your teeth and destroy your teeth. And, and so we're gingerly trying to chew this rice and everything. And, but while we're having this lunch with brown rice, first time, and may have had tofu or tempeh and some vegetables. All of a sudden, our landlady came into our apartment, which is not uncommon. The door was wide open because it's so swelteringly hot there. And she walks in. She looks at us. We're there sitting on a, a small rattan table or a, a small little stools. 
And there she sees the brown rice and the tempeh and the, and the vegetables. And all of a sudden she just goes nuts. You know, she just starts yelling and screaming in Khmer, which we couldn't understand yet. We didn't know how to speak the language yet enough yet. And so here she, her face is just going crazy you know, and running around and, and she grabs our brown rice, picks it up and throws it in the trash. And we're thinking, that was our lunch. Why did you do that? And she's blah, 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 trying to explain to us, but we could not understand at all. And so finally, <laughs> she left, realizing that we were idiots and couldn't communicate. And we sat there eating our vegetables and our protein, whatever it was. And no more rice is in the trash. We're not going to dig it out of the trash. And we, we had no idea what had happened for about two weeks. <laughs> we... We didn't eat much of the brown rice, or we, if we did, we had to try to do it in secret or something, so she wouldn't find it. I don't know, but I don't remember that part. But I remember in about two weeks, we found a person that spoke English and Khmer, and so we could actually communicate at that time because our Khmer was so poor. And uh, finally, we, we asked this person, what happened? We don't understand. Why would she do that? And as the person was listening to the story and how she was trying to do things and grab the rice and threw it away, he started smiling. And we thought, why are you smiling? And he said, oh, well, <laughs> he said, because in Cambodia, the only people who eat brown rice are pigs and convicts. That's why they don't clean it. And, and so here in her mind, she had walked into this house even though we were missionaries doing our best to live at the level of the people, we never could truly be at the level of the people because we had a passport. We could leave. Even though we tried to live as locally and as limited and as poor and our salary from our mission agency was low enough to try to help you do that. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a forced, forced poverty as it were, almost. I mean, even though we were trying to do that, the reality was we had plane tickets. We had passports. We were not trapped in that country. And in her mind, here's these wealthy Americans eating pig food, eating convict food. And she was trying to spare us that shame. And she picked it up and threw it in the trash. So it was, it was a learning experience. And, and we had many, many things like that through, through our time. And, uh, and this, I want to share a story today that takes us to the real heart of the issue. We, we lived there and our lives were transformed in the process. We eventually learned to speak the language so that we could communicate and go wherever we needed to do. I could get into trouble. I could get out of trouble <laughs> in another language Been doing that fine with English as well. But, uh, you know, we could get out of, of <laughs> speeding tickets or whatever. No speeding tickets. That's another story. Uh, but all the corruption and things we I got to where I would travel around the country and try to help connect uh, and connect with the Muslim population there that we were uh, living amongst. And even though it's a larger Bus Buddhist country, we were there working within the Muslim minority group. And in the process of doing that, I had one particular young man who would travel with me. And he was kind of like a translator when I couldn't understand, um, but more likely he was just more like a guide. And we would travel together and we would share many things deep in the heart and he was a, a young Muslim gentleman. He newly married, and he, his life was hard. He was what they called a motodope driver. Literally, that's a phrase, motodope. Um, and so what that meant was he was a moto taxi driver. They would be everywhere. You could see them on every corner. The moment you'd walk out of a building, you could just raise your hand, and boom, there'd be one of those moto drivers. And for less than a dollar, sometimes 25 cents or whatever, you know, 10, forget the coin, 10 cents or what, you know, a euro is higher than a dollar, but, you know, for very, very little money, they would take you all over the place. And so some of the first phrases we learned were turn left, turn right, please stop, all those things, because that's what the motor dopes understood, and they'd take you wherever you wanted to go. And that's what he did normally when he wasn't working with me. But he was always happy to work with me because I would give him an hourly rate for the time. And it was much, much better than what he'd have to do slaving out there in the sun and the humidity. And uh, so we, we became very close and good friends. And so 
all of a sudden, as things were changing in our family, and we noticed that there was so much prejudice against our oldest son, Elijah, because he's from Micronesia, he's brown, he's beautiful. And our daughter, Hannah, came out biological, so she's white. And there's the contrast. And so my wife would be traveling with the two of them. And people would just, they'd look at the three of them. And they'd stare and they'd look at Elijah. They'd look at Hannah. They'd look at my wife. And they'd finally say, aha, I know. You have a black husband. And she'd say, no, don't black husband. And then they go back to looking at Elijah, look at Hannah, back and forth. And they're trying to figure things out. Because remember, Cambodia had gone through such horrendous pain and loss during the Pol Pot regime and the Khmer Rouge there in 1975 to 79, where uh, anywhere up to 2 or 2.5 million of their people were killed off. And so every person there, the whole fabric of the society, they'd lost almost a complete generation of people. And so their, their social filters were gone. Uh, those that survived had seen such unspeakable things that it had, it had, it was a countrywide systemic trauma. Just everyone in PTSD because of that. And, and so here are the people are trying to figure things out. They're looking there. And finally, they, they would say, well, how do you have these two kids? And my wife would eventually have to say, he's adopted. Now, in English and possibly in some languages that you all speak in addition to English, maybe the word adopted has a positive connotation or a positive meaning to it that says, I love this child, I choose this child. But the problem was the moment she'd say that in Indonesian, uh, in Cambodian, they would say, oh, okay, now we know. Because the word that they used literally meant a child I take care of. And that verb, I take care of, was the same one that you'd use for taking care of chickens or taking care of livestock, taking care of pigs. And so tragically, it would say, this is a kid I'm putting up with. And so they'd be like, oh, okay, now we know. And they would treat Elijah like dirt and they treat Hannah like she was a queen and pinching their cheeks and oh, so beautiful and touching your hair. And, and we realized that if we were to remain in that country, it would destroy our two children. And so we made a very difficult decision to return to the States. And that's the part of the story I want to share. That day, when I shared with my friend Ahmed, I said, Ahmed, my family and I are going to need to return to the United States. He immediately turned and he faced the wall with his hand against the wall and he began to weep out loud, loudly weeping. And I'm thinking, wow. I mean, this is sad. We're, of course, we're going to miss, but I, I, he's weeping. He's just crying his head off. And of course, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I didn't realize we were making that kind of an impression on his life or otherwise. I mean, I realized probably some financial benefit. And, and, he, and he, we, he wept like that for about, about two minutes. And during that time, I'm thinking, wow, praise God. I didn't realize we we're touching lives that much. And after about two minutes, he picks his hand and head off the wall, and he starts looking around our apartment, our house. And he says, can I have that? Uh, can I have that? <laughs> and in a moment, my head goes from thinking, wow, we're making a difference to, okay, now we're just a supplier for him to be able to get things. And he's like, can I get that? Can I get that? <laughs> it was such an incredible switch. And of course, it's just completely pop back down to normal but i understood we were living in a place where uh so many people were just completely poverty stricken generations of poverty people living on less than two dollars a day i was doing a little bit of quick research here recently according to the united nations uh people that are under a dollar 90 united, united states dollars to be a little bit less for the euro i mean a smaller value because the value is more $1.90 is what they consider extreme poverty. And now Ahmed wasn't quite in that level, but we are surrounded by people like that. And so life is all about how do I survive? How do I get what I need? And, and so I understood that. And so he's asking, can I have that? Can you have that bookcase and all these things? And that's the way it was for the next couple of weeks. 
But then something happened. I will never forget this. One day he came to visit and our house was emptying out. People had come to get our, our various things. We were selling things off. We were giving things away. We were packing up. And people had settled into the fact that we were leaving. But Ahmed walked into our house one day, he walked into the kitchen, and at his eye level, we had a particularly special uh, cupboard, I guess you'd call it. Um, it was one that would close and it would be sealed, and there were no way for bugs to get inside. And it had, it had legs in the bottom, which we could then put in baby powder, which kept the ants from going up. And so the cockroaches couldn't fly in, the ants couldn't climb up. It was the perfect place to keep things you wanted to keep out of the bug world, which was nice because there's bugs everywhere. And, and it, was, it went up to about his eye level. And as he walked in, he turned and he looked at top of that counter, that, that cupboard, and he saw a watch. Now, not a very nice watch, maybe maybe a $25 watch in the United States, just a simple watch. It had the, you know, the, the hands that go around and maybe the date there, uh, a little black leather band, just very simple watch, uh, inexpensive. And he picked up the watch and just this, this look of confusion on his face came over him. He looked at me and I was wearing my one watch that I had it was a Casio or something that I used. It was a little bit more waterproof and I would use all the time. But he picked up that watch. He stared at me. And he said, he said, you have, you have two watches? Like, why on earth would you have two watches? What kind of incredible wealth is that? that you would waste it to have two watches because a guy can only wear one at a time. And I must admit, immediately in my mind, I began to argue. I mean, not that it was, not, not, not trying to justify necessarily, but I probably was. I mean, here, you know, coming from the West, and I'm, you guys as well, we have so much stuff. We, we have more than we need. In fact, the Bible describes the church in the last days as being rich, right? Wealthy and, and feeling like we have need of nothing. That's us. And, and even though my family and I had sold everything and we had, we had literally winnowed down all of our stuff to 12 suitcases or eight suitcases, and we had shipped over maybe a, a square meter of stuff. That's all. That's all we had. We had gotten rid of everything else. And yet still, in Ahmed's mind, I was wealthy beyond expression because I had two watches. And in my heart, I'm beginning to defend and to argue. And, and, and I can feel the argument coming up more and more. And I'm, I'm about ready to say something. And then that still small voice whispered said, he's right, Brian. How many watches do you need? And I surrendered my heart. And that was the day when I became a one watch man. No need for two. But, but more than that, I remember teaching Ahmed how to read that watch, how to tell time on it as I gave him that as a gift. And he, he took that as though it was one of the most precious things, even though very little value necessarily in our mind. But for him, it meant so much. And yet for me, it was a life-changing moment. Because as I began to open my heart to scripture, and think about things, and I want to read some scripture to you. Um, I was challenged. You know, the, the American, I'll just, United States of America, the, the American mentality, maybe it's different for y'all in Europe. I have no idea. I, I imagine it's a Western thing more. But we have this idea that you, you can never have enough. You, you get more and more and more. We have, we have people struggling 
with the with the the problem of hoarding things, uh, literally never giving things away. Uh, I have I have friends that struggle with the point where their house has become so filled with stuff that it's not even possible for you to walk around. There's simply pathways. I mean, it's actually there, there's a mental challenge there. It's more than just gimme gimme gimme, but it's it's become this real problem and and yet. When you hear scripture, we're invited to a life that is so much different from that. A life where we're not finding our value in things. A life where we're not being bound by what we own, but a life of freedom. Let me just read to you some incredible words here from Matthew chapter 6. Um, this, these are life-changing words. Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to read about a nine verses here so i'll start with verse 25 it says therefore i say to you and this is jesus talking he says do not worry about your life what you'll eat or what you'll drink nor about your body what you'll put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing <laughs> the stuff look at the birds in the air <laughs> for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not of more value than they? Recently, we've be moved to an absolutely beautiful place and there are birds all over the back. It, it is just, it fills our soul. And here you have all these beautiful birds and to think that God cares and knows each and every one of them and he cares for them. We help out too and give bird food, but are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubic to his stature? Or maybe I could add a little more hair to my head. No. So why? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient unto the day is its own trouble. As those thoughts ran through my mind, I realized here's Ahmed. He doesn't have a, a deep relationship with, with God. He didn't know these truths. He was in a journey of his own. But it's normal then. Yeah, we seek all those things. Gimme, give gimme, give let me find. We've got, because we don't have someone to trust, we need to then do our best to care for ourselves. But here Jesus is inviting us to a life, a life of trust, a life of knowing that you are cared for. We, you don't have to be the one that determines your future. You don't have to be the one that tries to provide for yourself. We have a heavenly father who has chosen us before the foundation of the world, that we be his, completely loved, adopted. I'm now paraphrasing Ephesians chapter 1. Are you guys still reading Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 like I mentioned when I was there last year? Please remind yourself who you are, whose you are. Incredible stuff. God chose us before the foundation of the world. We don't have to be living our lives with worry. And when Ahmed did that, it challenged me started to think what really matters now it's not that you can't have things it's not we're supposed to sell everything but there is a change that needs to happen in our mind where we realize that life is not about the acquiring of stuff life is not simply about our life here we have been transformed by the grace of god set free to a new life so that we can then love and bless others it's not about us. It's about serving others. 
And so I wanted to share a few thoughts with you about that. You know, especially now. Some people in this time of COVID, fear. Fear is just robbing people of what it means to be alive. Fear is having people wonder what can, they can do. And, and, and it's like we're fearful about the future so much. We're, we're not listening to these words to know that are you not more precious than the birds of the air? Let your father love you. He knows where you're at. He knows your needs. In fact, because of COVID, a lot of churches have stopped meeting. Yours may be similar there. But I remember something very amazing. Uh, the pastors in our place, we were all on a, a phone call and we happened to talk to the conference president. And one of the pastors asked a question. He said, our church members are wondering what to do about tithes and offerings because we're not meeting right now. Uh, what do we do? And our conference president said something that was quite surprising. He said, well, folks, first of all, tithe, there's nothing to talk about there. That's a direct command from God. If we're choosing to honor him and to follow our, our faith in trusting God, then that 10%, that's, that comes off right off the top. There's no discussion there. That's clear. That doesn't change in the time of COVID. That doesn't change when they're persecuting and killing Christians around the world. No, that just means God is my father. I give back as an acknowledgement. So tithe, that's a given. That comes in. No, no discussion. But he said, then the second most important thing after that tithe is the local church. A lot of the guys were kind of surprised. They thought, well, what about, you know, like ADRA or helping against um, poverty and all those things, all the various ministries that the church has around the world. That's the incredible gift that we have of being part of a worldwide movement is that your church, my church, we can impact a widow in the depths of Sudan with the ministry, uh, we can reach out. I have friends in larger, larger churches that are just themselves, and they have certain mission projects, but that's it. That's all they can do because that's all they're able to reach out and do as, as a little body of people. But for us, the way that God has organized this world church is that we're able to minister all around the world like that way. And sometimes there's many people who are then giving to other ministries and all these things, and they want to make sure that it's going exactly where they want. And so when he said the most important offering and the thing to support is the local church, everybody was shocked. And they said, why? And he said this. He says, you need to remember, COVID is not going to last forever. We're going to need to be able to come back to these churches. We need to keep the lights on. We need to keep paying for the rent or whatever it may be so that these churches remain a lighthouse in the communities that they've been raised up to serve. He says, yes, you can support other ministries, of course, and support other things, but we need to make sure that the local church, the local body of Christ in that place that's meant to shine and to share and to love, that that does not disappear when COVID is over. And it was quite shocking to think that through because a lot of folks, I don't know about what's happening there, but a lot of folks in our area were thinking, oh, we've got to just make sure we got enough. We've got to, you know, take care of things. And we've got a lot of doomsday preppers around here, too, <laughs> this part of the country, especially. And, uh, you know, so they've got to, we've got to make sure you have all this food and stock it away and all those things, which basically means you get to be robbed first. But that's not what they're thinking. And <laughs> where's the trust? Where's the fact that says, I belong to the God of the universe? I am loved. I am cared for. I do not need to worry about tomorrow because each day will take care of itself. God is for us. He's guiding us. And to have people move from this fear mentality and saving and controlling and all these things to realize that we are called to serve. We're called to live by these principles of loving people, serving God, giving, giving back to our community, giving back to the church there so that it can continue to minister in its location so that when life maybe comes back to some kind of normal or it empowers us to be able to reach out in the midst of the fear, in the midst of the trouble, we can do that. And so it, it's, it really shocked me as I have thought about that. I wanted to pass that on to you to, to pray. You know, 
John the Baptist talked about if you have two coats, give one away. That's really tough. I mean, some of us have a lot of coats. I mean, you need one for the fall. You need one for the winter. I mean, I'm not saying that all of a sudden you strip down to one. I mean, there's people that do that, but no one can tell you what you should do. But I know that each one of us need to realize that this world is not our home, that we are called to be part of so much bigger. We're called to minister and to share so that the gospel can go forward to touch lives like Ahmed and many, many others all around you and around me. Recently, I was talking with a friend and, and they realized it. They used a phrase that you've probably heard before. But if not, it's a good one to think about. This person was all stressed out um, and they've had some challenges in life. They recently lost a family member and it, it's, it's tough. But this person was struggling with all the stress and, and the changes. And then they said, I need someone to take care of my swimming pool. Am I gonna have to do it? And then they stopped themselves. And they said, I guess that's a first world problem, isn't it? <laughs> a first world problem. You know, those of us living in the West, first world nations, a challenge would be, okay, how do I keep my pool clean? When you have over a billion people struggling to find clean water to drink, that's a first world problem. I think of my friend Ahmed. You wouldn't find him stressed about how to keep the pool clean. He's stressed about how to exist and to care. And so brothers and sisters, we have been so incredibly blessed. I mean, praise God, we have technology here. We can connect from around the world. God has blessed each and every one of us, not just financially, not just with the things that we have, but more than that. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing necessary in the heavenly places. Every spiritual blessing, Ephesians 1. You know, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. The question for all of us is, do we believe that? Do we trust him? Do we let him work in our life in such a way that we are willing to give and to share and to serve and to support a much bigger work than just our own personal needs. And so tonight, I, I hope that these thoughts will spur you to righteousness, um, challenge you a bit. I don't know what the Spirit may invite you to do, but um, our conference president has a habit of saying a phrase a lot of people don't like to say. He says, we need to continue giving sacrificially you know giving sometimes till it hurts and i don't know what that means for you um i know what it means in our family and our life and all those things but let the spirit of god guide you and and think about the local church and and supporting the the, the ministry of of the gospel going to the world the tithes um we are such a blessed organization in the sense that we are there is enough organization to allow us to exist in so many things. Don't allow yourself to be discouraged by, oh, we get this pastor or that pastor or the, or the, the conference does this or that. There's always going to be problems. It's not perfect. There's going to be broken aspects to it. But it's not about that. It's about my personal response to God. It's about me remembering that I don't care for myself. God cares for us. And that to the commitment to tithe and the commitment to offerings and to supporting the local church and then supporting the ministries that God puts on your heart in addition to that. Uh, yes, we need to be doing that because it's, it's not just about money. God can make money. That's not the problem. He's got the cows in a thousand hills. He can sell some. That's not the point. He wants hearts. Our heart. When our hearts are surrendered, our wallets are open. When our hearts are focused on ourselves, our wallets are closed. Please, I invite you to prayerfully ask God, what does this mean for you?
And maybe this will be the day where you become a one watch person or whatever that may be for you. I don't know, but I know God does. So I pray that he will richly bless you because as he blesses you, he wants you to bless others. Remember, God loves to speak through blessings given or blessings removed. I would invite you to stay on the one side of that. He wants to bless you so you can bless others. Learn to live your life giving and sharing and supporting, and you'll be amazed at what he does. So thank you for this time to share together. Can I pray with you? And then we'll definitely have some time to talk here together. Let's pray. Our great God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, all praise and glory to you. Thank you. Thank you that you chose us before the foundation of the world, that we'd be yours, completely adopted, set apart, and we are now actually joint heirs with Christ Jesus in the heavenly places. <laughs> Father, please set us free from our clamoring and grasping and self-centered controlling to where we think that we have to care for ourselves. Set us free to a deeper journey with you where we learn to trust you in all things. Seeking first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, knowing that all these other things will be added to us. Father, please set us free to live like that to love like that, to give like that, and to walk with you in a beautiful life. So bless us now abundantly that we may bless others. We pray this all because of Jesus who makes it possible. Amen.